I have to talk to you about video games. So yes. you you were being a bit trolly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're you're having more and more fun on Twitter on X, which is great to see. So a guy named Jimmy Apples tweeted, "Let me play a video game of my VO3 videos already." Uh, Google cooked so good. Playable world models when spelled W E N question mark, uh, and then you quote tweeted that with now wouldn't that be something? <laughs> so how how hard is it to build game worlds with AI? Maybe can you look out into the future uh, of video games mm. five ten years out? Mm. What do you think that looks like? Well, games were my first love, really, and doing AI for games was the first thing I did professionally in, in my teenage years, and and was the first uh, major AI systems that I built. And uh, I always want to have, I want to scratch that itch one day and come back to that. So you know, and I will do, I think. And um, I think I sort of dream about, you know, what would I have done back in the '90s if I'd had access to the kind of AI systems we have today? And I think you could build absolutely mind blowing games. Um, and I think the next stage is I always used to love making all the games i've made are open world games mm -hmm. so they're games where there's a simulation and then there's ai characters and then the player uh interacts with that simulation and the simulation adapts to the way the player plays and i always thought they were the coolest games because uh so games like theme park that i worked on where everybody's game experience would be unique to them mm -hmm. right because you're kind of co-creating the game Right. Uh, we set up the parameters, we set up initial conditions, and then you as the player immersed in it, and then you are co-creating it with the, with the simulation. But of course, it's very hard to program open world games. You know, you've got to be able to create uh, content, whichever direction the player goes in, and you want it to be compelling, no matter what the player chooses. Um, and so it was always quite difficult to build uh, things like cellular automata, actually, type of those kind of classical systems, which created some emergent behavior. Um, but they're always a little bit fragile, a little bit limited. Now we're maybe on the cusp in the next few years, five, 10 years of having AI systems that can truly create around your imagination, um, can sort of dynamically change the story and story tell the narrative around uh, and make it dramatic no matter what you end up choosing. So it's like the ultimate choose your own adventure sort of game. And, uh, you know, I think maybe we're within reach if you think of a kind of interactive version of VO uh, and then wind that forward five to 10 years and, um, you know, imagine how good it's going to be. Yeah, so you said a lot of super interesting stuff there. So one, the open world built into that is a deep personalization, the way you've described it. Mm. So it's not just that it's open world, like you can open any door and there'll be something there. It's that the choice of which door you open in an unconstrained way defines the worlds you see. So some games try to do that, they give you choice, yes, but it's really just an illusion of choice because yes. you're only, uh, uh, like like Stanley Parable, this yeah. game I recently played. It's 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 really there's a couple of doors and it really just takes you down a narrative. Stanley Parable is a great video game. I recommend people yeah. play that. Kind of uh, in a meta way, uh, <laughs> mocks the illusion of choice and there's philosophical notions of free will and so on. But uh, I do like one of my favorite games of Elder Scrolls is Daggerfall, I believe that they really played with a like random generation of the dungeons yeah of if you can step in and they yes. give you this feeling of an open world and there you mentioned interactivity you don't need to interact that, that's a first step because you don't need to interact that much you just when you open the door whatever you see is randomly generated for you yeah. and that's already an incredible experience because you might be the only person to ever see that yeah exactly and and so, but what you'd like is a little bit better than sort of a random generation, right? So you'd like, uh, and and also better than a simple A B hard coder choice, right? That's not really uh, open world, right? As, as you say, it's just giving you the illusion of choice. What you want to be able to do is is potentially anything in that game environment, um, and. I think the only way you can do that is to have uh, generated systems, systems that uh, will generate that on the fly. Of course, you can't create infinite amounts of game assets, right? It's expensive enough already how AAA games are made today. And that was obvious to, to us back in the 90s when I was working on all these games. I think maybe Black and White uh, was the game that I worked on early stages of 
that that had the still probably the best AI learning AI in it. It was an early reinforcement learning system that you you know you were you were looking after this mythical creature and growing it and nurturing it, and depending how you treated it, it would treat the villagers in that world in the same way. So if you were mean to it, it would be mean. If you were good, it would be protective. And so it was really a reflection of the way you played it. So actually, all of the uh, I've been working on sort of simulations and AI. Uh, it, through the medium of games at the beginning of my career and and really the whole of what I do today is still a follow-on from uh, those early more hard-coded ways of doing the AI to now you know fully general learning systems that that are trying to achieve the same thing yeah it's been uh, interesting hilarious and uh, fun to watch you and Elon obviously itching to create games because you're both gamers <laughs> and one of the sad aspects of your uh, incredible success in so many domains of science, like serious adult stuff, yeah. that you might not have time to really create a game. You might end up creating the tooling that others will create the game. And right. you have to watch <laughs> yeah, exactly. other, others create the thing you've always dreamed of. Do you think it's possible you can somehow in your extremely busy schedule actually find time to create something like black and white, some some an actual video game where like you could make the childhood dream yeah. <laughs> become, become well, reality. Well, you know, oh, there's two things where I think about that is maybe that with vibe coding as it gets better, there's a possibility <laughs> yes. that I could, you know, sure. one could do that actually in the, in your spare time. So I'm quite excited about that as a, as that would be my project if, <laughs> if I got the time to do some vibe coding. Um, I'm actually itching to do that. And then the other thing is, you know, maybe it's a sabbatical after AGI has been safely stewarded into the world and delivered into the world, you know, that and then working on my physics theory as we talked about at the beginning those would be the two my my two post agi projects let's call it that way <laughs> I, I would love to see which the ultimate post game a, post agi which you choose solving uh the the problem that some of the smartest people in human history contended with so p equals mp <laughs> or creating a cool video yeah well I, they, but they might but in my world they'd be related because it would sure. be an open world simulated game sure. uh as realistic as possible so you know what what is what is the universe? That's 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 speaking to the same question, right? MP equals MP. I think all these things are related, at least in my mind. I mean, in a really serious way, it's like video games sometimes are looked down upon as just this fun side activity. But especially as uh, AI does more and more of uh, the difficult, uh, boring tasks, something we in, in modern world call work. You know, video games is the thing in which we may find meaning, in which we may find like what to do with our time. You could create incredibly rich, meaningful experiences. Like that's what human life is. And then in video games, you can create more sophisticated, more diverse ways of living, yep. right? That's I think so. Idea. I mean, those of us who love games, and I still do, is, 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 um, you know, it's almost can let your imagination run wild, right? Like I, I used to love games um, and working on games so much because it's the fusion, especially in the '90s and two, early 2000s, the sort of golden era, maybe the '80s of 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 game of the games industry, and it was all being discovered. New genres were being discovered. We weren't just making games; we felt we were we were creating a new entertainment medium that never existed before, right? especially with these open world games and simulation games, where you were co-create, you as the player were co-creating the story. There's no other media. Uh, entertainment media where you do that, where you as the audience actually co-create the the story. And of course, now with multiplayer games as well, it can be a very social activity and can explore all kinds of interesting worlds in that. But on the other hand, you know, it's very important to um, also enjoy and experience uh, the physical world. But the question is then, you know, I think we're going to have to kind of confront the question again of what is the fundamental nat nature of reality? Uh, what is going to be the difference between these increasingly realistic simulations and uh, multiplayer ones and em emergent um, and what we do in the real world? Yeah, there's clearly a huge amount of value to experiencing the real world, nature. There's also a huge amount of value in experiencing other humans directly in person, the way mm -hmm. we're sitting here today. Yes. But we need to really scientifically, rigorously answer the question, why? Yeah, And exactly. which aspect of that can be mapped yep. into the virtual world? Exactly. So and it's not, it's not enough to say, yeah, you should go touch grass and hang out in nature. It's like, why yeah. exactly yeah. is that valuable? Yes. And I guess that's maybe the thing that's 
been uh, haunting me, obsessing me from the beginning of my career. If you think about all the different things I've done, that's they're all related in that way. The simulation, nature of reality, and what is the bounds of you know what can be modeled. Sorry for the ridiculous question, but so far, what is the greatest video game of all time? What's up there? <laughs> what, what well, my it... favorite one of all time is Civilization. I, I have to say that that was the the, the Civilization One and Civilization Two, my favorite games of all time. Um, I can only assume you've avoided the most recent one because it would probably you would that would be your sabbatical that would, you would disappear. <laughs> yes, exactly. They take a lot of time these civilization games, so uh, I've got to be careful with them. Fun question. You and Elon seem to be somehow solid gamers. Uh, is there a connection between being great at gaming and and uh, being great leaders of AI companies? I don't know. I, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, we both love games and uh, it's interesting he wrote games as well to start off with. It's probably, especially in the era I grew up in where home computers were just became a thing, you know, in the late 80s and 90s, especially in the UK. I had a Spectrum and then an, a Commodore Amiga 500, which nice. is my, my favorite computer ever. And that's why I learned all my programming. And of course, it's a very fun thing uh, to program is to program games. So I think it's a great way to learn programming, probably still is. And, um, and then of course I immediately took it in directions of AI and simulations, which, so I may, was able to express my interest in, in games uh, and my sort of wider scientific interests altogether. And then the final thing I think that's great about games is it fuses, um, artistic design, you know, art with the, the, the most cutting edge programming um so again in the 90s all of the most interesting uh, technical advances were happening in gaming whether that was ai graphics physics engines uh hardware even gpus of course were designed for gaming originally um so everything that was pushing computing forward in the in the 90s was due to gaming so interestingly that was where the forefront of research was going on and it was this incredible fusion with with art um you know graphics but also music and just the whole new media of storytelling and i love that for me it's this sort of multidisciplinary kind of effort is again something i've enjoyed my whole my whole life